Welcome to the Picture This Photography Podcast, where we talk about all things photography. And today, we're going to talk about some geeky little photography facts you might not have known, including the fact that Tony, Kodak had a nuclear reactor in their basement. No, you're not allowed to have nuclear reactors. You are, and I'll tell you how and why. And Apple had a digital camera. All right, that sounds really exciting. But first, we should take a minute and thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need your own website, domain, portfolio, you can make it happen with Squarespace. And it's so easy. If you can drag and drop, you can make your own. Go into the description below, click the link, squarespace.com slash Chelsea. You get a 14-day free trial. And if you decide you'd like to buy it, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Tony, did you know that Kodak had a nuclear reactor in their basement? No, this seems crazy. So a lot of people know Kodak from being a camera manufacturer, a filmmaker, they made the literal film, uh, and they actually invented the first digital camera in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But they scrapped that because they were selling film and I guess they just didn't see how that could work out for them. Uh, recently it was discovered that Kodak had a nuclear reactor in the basement of their Rochester, New York building and they had managed to keep it a secret all that time until some big mouth ex-employee told someone about it. And so I started digging around on the internet. I found some articles from CNN. It was a big deal. Uh, not only was it a nuclear reactor, but it had weapon grade enriched uranium. Do you have any idea why they had this? Yeah, I do. It was a research nuclear reactor. So it wasn't a nuclear reactor in the sense where it was like big enough to make you know, electricity for a town or something like that. It was about the size of a refrigerator, had three and a half pounds of enriched uranium, and they used it to check the purity of the chemical. So like we were talking about, they made film and they, they made cameras and things like that. I couldn't find anything that gave a specific example of how they used the reactor, but I just found that they said they were um, checking the purity of some chemicals and also using it to get like pictures on an atomic level without degrading the the molecules themselves so they were doing scientific research basically as a person with an IT security background mm -hmm. this seems bonkers to trust a private company that is not doing military or government work with something so potentially dangerous so I, all right so I did some research you tend to read headlines and they're very sensational so I was like what does this actually mean how rare is this is it really a danger and I started looking into uh, countries with nuclear reactors and these research nuclear reactors. So if you'll scroll through, because I forgot the exact number again, uh, about 30 of 197 countries have nuclear reactors. But smaller ones, these research nuclear reactors, like 69 countries have them, and they're usually in the possession, they're usually possessed by like universities, research centers, and the military. Um, and they're typically small. So I looked into this long list of countries that have the re reactors. I looked into the individual reactors. I got pretty deep into like how to make nuclear bombs and how much uranium and this, that, and the other. And that's why I'm always randomly selected at security checkpoints, Tony, because my search history is not great. Anyway, a lot of these um, research nuclear reactors have been shut down. They've been dismantled. They've been cocooned so that they're safe. And one said it was intentionally exploded, which I, I'm not really sure what that means. <laughs> but yeah, it that sounds, sounds like a really bad idea. It sounds fun. <laughs> um, uh, the one thing that really makes this interesting is the enriched uranium, because I was saying it's weapons grade. So most research nuclear reactors right now use 20% enriched uranium. And this Kodak nuclear reactor had 93% enriched uranium, which is weapon grade. This is the type of uranium where some countries aren't allowed to have it. And we have entire agreements between countries about who's allowed to have this level of uranium. And apparently they're just dishing it out to Kodak. <laughs> they had three and a half pounds of it. I found out that's not enough to make a bomb, but it's a ser security threat because it's a low guarded source of enriched uranium and there are quite a few other like research reactors so they don't want someone to come in and collect a bunch of them and do something harmful with it hmm. like what's the worst that could happen with that amount like if you couldn't build a nuclear bomb 
Could you build some kind of dirty bomb or what would happen if you stuck it in the water supply or something? I don't know, but I did read that there wasn't, there was almost no chance of it melting down. So it wasn't really a threat on its own. Hmm. Um, after 9-11, post 9-11, like Kodak realized that it was a, a security risk. And so the government helped them remove it for security purposes in 2007 and the federal authorities they oversaw the entire removal and people at Kodak still didn't know about it and people in the town of Rochester New York did not know about it the police didn't know about it the fire department didn't know about it and it was escorted out with guards a helicopter a really high security operation and then delivered to another site I want to say in like South Carolina or something where I think they dismantled everything terrifying I know. It's really interesting that something like that could exist in a company and they kept it a secret from the public for so long. Good bit of trivia, Chelsea. Thank you. Uh, we can never fly again. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my first bit of trivia, and it cannot compare with a nuclear reactor, but it's the hot shoe. This is something that we all see every day. We use it every day. And I got curious about it because every camera I've ever had has this hot shoe in the same basic shape. Yeah. I thought, who made this, and how is it that it has had such longevity? It's not actually good, right? How many <laughs> times have you been taking flash pictures and suddenly it stops and you have to like take your flash out and kind of put it back in and reseed it? And I've had cameras get shorted out because it gets wet up here because mm -hmm. they're just like big exposed contacts. So it's one of these like, we're holding on to it, but it's not a good standard. <laughs> You're right, it's not. Yeah, it's kind of a pain. Uh, you could, everybody could probably guess who invented this. It was Leica in 1913. The very first Leica, it didn't have a hot shoe, it didn't take a flash, but it had a, what we would call a cold shoe, what they called an accessory mount in, mm -hmm. in German. And it was it shaped exactly like our current flash shoes, like the exact width, the exact height, and it had a little barrier on the front to stop your accessory viewfinder from sliding forward too far. So you would put a viewfinder in there? Yeah, so the camera came with its own little viewfinder and what whatever its default lens was, and maybe it was 35 millimeters, and you would have to look through a separate viewfinder that was not the lens because it was a rangefinder style camera. So if you put, then put on a 50 millimeter or an 18 millimeter lens, your viewfinder wouldn't match up with what the lens was, lens was seeing. So mm -hmm. then you would ex snap in an accessory viewfinder, which just gave you that other angle of view. And they thought, mm, we need some way to stick this viewfinder onto the top. And they came up with that. And at the time, everybody was about Leicas. That's the camera that everybody wanted. And post-World War II especially, Canon and Nikon were just copying everything Leica did including this flash mount. And as a result, it became ubiquitous. Everybody was using this particular design to stick stuff to their cameras. That was a viewfinder? I, ar archaic by our standards, right? <laughs> the next major development was in 1938. It was the Univex Mercury. And this seems to be the first camera to adopt the hot shoe, to turn this accessory mount into something that could actually trigger a flash. And what they did was, if you look in the top of your hot shoe, you will see a big round circle right in the middle of it, the biggest contact there. That's an electrical contact, and when you take a picture and the camera thinks a flash should fire, it gives out a little charge. And that's from the Univex Mercury from 1938? Yeah, and like I, this is a camera I've never heard of, and I've researched lots of old cameras. It had that same contact that is in all of your modern cameras. And it, gives, it gave off like the same basic voltage. And this voltage was enough to trip a flash. Even though it was a mechanical camera, like you could still create a little bit of voltage by like, I don't know, something would strike mechanically in it and it would just give that little bit of voltage. Mm. And this is why some flashes today can work with any camera. Like if you pick up a basic flash, it'll work in Canon, it'll work on Nikon, Fuji because they all support that one round center contact. Oh, so it's just a very basic center contact that's kind of universal. Yeah, and so the Univex Mercury is from 1938, but I also want to give a shout out to the original Canon Quanon prototype camera, which to my eye seems to have a contact in exactly the same place. But nobody gives it credit, so I'm not, I haven't 
tried it. I don't know if that works or not, but it seems to have that same contact. Throughout the years since 1938, manufacturers have continued to use that same contact, but they've also started adding in other little contacts to add more intelligent features to their flashes, things like what we call through the lens metering, TTL mm -hmm. metering. And uh, Sony in their most recent cameras will even allow you to put in a shotgun mic and have it digitally connect to the camera because there's a series of tiny little electrical contacts at the very end of the flash shoe. So every manufacturer has extended it in some way while still supporting the backwards compatibility that allows us to use any flash. ISO even standardized this in ISO standard 518. So there is like a universal worldwide standard based on the 1913 Leica. So there's your little bit of trivia. The next okay. time you see a, a hot shoe, think Leica's original camera. Okay, after the break, we're going to talk about the Apple digital camera that was one of the first consumer digital cameras. And Tony, you've got some more standardization talk. <laughs> Your your stuff is so much cooler no, than mine. No, don't say that. Your stuff is cool, okay? I just have a shorter attention span. Okay, tell us about Squarespace. All right, Squarespace. Heard of it? <laughs> you can make a website there, and it's very affordable and very easy to do. And we're going to offer you a 14-day free trial. That means you don't have to put in a credit card and remember to cancel. You can make your website. You can make your portfolio. You can show off your pictures. And it's so easy to do, and it's helpful. I made one for my mother recently as a gift. It took me about 20 minutes to make. It was that easy. And I looked at her analytics and she got like 500 people visiting within the first few days and clicking through all over. I know. Is that just because she told everybody she talked to? Probably, but that's what you should do. Her mom talks a lot. <laughs> of course, where do you think I got it from? So anyway, go to the description down below, click on the link at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Try that 14 day free trial. Look at your analytics, see that it's working, that people want to look at your about page. They want to see what's for sale. And if you decide you'd like to buy it, because it will pay for itself, use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. So thanks Squarespace. Thanks. Uh, now tell us about the Apple camera, not the Apple iPhone camera, but Apple made actual cameras. Yeah, and this this one surprised me because we've actually researched the first digital cameras before. And, you know, I think like Fuji had one that they released at some trade show. And then, of course, Nikon had the F3 um, and that had a, a, sorry, a Kodak sensor, but it was targeted towards photojournalists. Uh, and then there was this like Logitech made camera and it was vertical and it was black and white. And I think it wrote on the disc. There were earlier ones, but Apple came out with this quick take digital camera and it was the first widely accepted consumer level digital camera in the United States. And it came out in 1994. Um, they had three different models of it. They had the quick take 100, uh, the quick take 150 and the quick take 200. And they were really marketing the ease of use, how easy it was to use. And I can imagine how appealing that would be because film was not easy to use and digital could be instant. Uh, it won a 1995 product design award, which is impressive. And they designed it for Mac and Windows, which I find interesting because now everything they kind of try to enclose in their own system. Uh, and Time Magazine in 2010 named it one of the most 100 important gadgets since 1923, which might seem kind of absurd because who has heard of this camera? But if you think about it, they may have been the ones to appeal to consumers with a digital camera um, because then, of course, everybody moved over to digital. Tony. I, I vaguely remember this camera, I think, but I was shooting film at the time and I was such a snob that I would look at the results <gasps> and I would be like, oh, my film scanner does way better than this. Okay. Get out of here with your quick take 100. Well, you know, maybe I'll understand that choice when I read the specs. Because okay. the specs are hilarious. Uh, the quick take 100, the 100 model, had 0.3 megapixels. Three megapixels? Not three. <laughs> 0.3 megapixels. The first camera in 1974 had 0.01 or 0.001. It was not 
<laughs> like <Good>. 12 pixels. <laughs> it was not good. Uh, and this, this Quick Take 100 had a Kodak sensor. So Kodak, we don't think of them too much anymore, but they were where it was at. They made sensors for Fuji. They made sensors for Nikon. They made sensors for Apple. They were like... They had weapons grade uranium laying around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, they had a nuclear reactor. Like no one was messing with them. Um, this Quick Take 100 could store eight photos at full resolution. Full resolution. Whoa, whoa. Or 32 if you took pictures that were 0 0.07 megapixels. Yeah, this is VGA, if people remember VGA. I don't know what that is. You're not one of the people who remembers VGA. <laughs> it's 640 by 480. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, it had a built-in flash, but it had no controls for focus or zoom. It had a 50 millimeter equivalent lens. And Tony, listen to these shutter speeds. 1 30th to 1 1 75th. So you like three and a half stops? So That's the entire shutter speed but range? But also like no pictures of anyone under age 10. <laughs> yeah. That's so <laughs> weird. Like we had fast shutters at the time. I don't know why. Um, okay. I don't know. And then the aperture was f2.8 to f16, uh, ISO equivalent of 85. Just one ISO? You couldn't change the ISO? No, I think in the later models, some things adapted, like the 150, some things changed, and then go to, come on. And then the Quick Take 200 added a preview screen on the back, so the first one did not have that. Uh, focus and aperture controls, a smart media card, which looks more like an SD card, I think, before you had to plug it right into your computer. And at this point, it was also built by Fuji. So they, they only made three models for three years. Um, and mm. I went to Cult of Mac, which is this website. I was kind of digging around for pictures of it and, and firsthand accounts. And I found this interview by David Pierini. And he interviewed one of his friends that had it. And I want to read you this quote, Tony. Okay. Um, Evan Killam says, it took terrible pictures. I'm not sure if we even had a concept of megapixels back then, but the quick take had none of them. The output was grainy, the flash made everyone look like ghosts, and for some reason my iMac did not always recognize that the camera was plugged in. Maybe it was trying to save me from the disappointment of seeing how badly everything had turned out. <laughs> so, but he also went on to say that like, he had a glimpse of the future, mm -hmm. and so maybe the pictures weren't impressive, but they were because the technology was so new, and because it led to so much. There really is such a thing as being ahead of its time. It was ahead of its time. And I, yeah, it sounds like it really was. Okay, we're looking at a picture now taken with the Quick Take 100. Uh, it's by Franny Witzel, and it's of an antique store with all sorts of things, some grass, a boat, and it is extremely low resolution. The only thing I know to compare it to is an impressionistic painting. Uh, yeah, like if Monet painted a picture of an antique store. <laughs> Yeah, it's not impressive. And then, after only three years and three models, in 1997, Steve Jobs returned to Apple. He was fired in 1985. In 1997, he came back. He wanted to streamline operations. He got rid of some divisions within Apple, including the quick take cameras. So he did away with them. Uh, Kodak, Fujifilm, Canon, and Nikon all introduced their own consumer level digital cameras after that. And, and the rest is history. Yeah, then like 2007, when did they introduce the iPhone with its camera that would eventually completely dominate consumer photography a few years later? Yeah, I the know. The revenge of Steve Jobs. I know, I things really came around. Guess he made the right choice. Tony, I'm gonna set you up here because you're gonna be talking about the tripod mount and the standardization and where that comes from. This is so exciting. Take if it away. You like to understand the little bits of history around you. The tripod mount is that little screw that's on the bottom of your camera, and it allows you to connect any tripod to any camera. And that's pretty amazing because camera manufacturers don't like to standardize stuff. You know, they all have unique lens mounts because if you buy a Canon camera, they want you to use Canon lenses. Mm -hmm. But I guess nobody wanted to compete with tripods, so they just all use the same screw. And I asked myself, where does this screw come from? Like, who made this. What a mind. 
<laughs> so it actually goes back to like 800 BC. The Egyptians were the first people to take a little metal rod and then some metal wire and solder it around it to make a threaded bolt. Hold on, you're telling me the Egyptians invented the screw? Yeah, they basically did. And then a little bit later, people started making nuts where you could screw something onto the bolt and have them match up. But there we started this real challenge of getting the threads of bolts to match up to the threads of nuts. Because if they're not perfect, then you know, you get a couple of twists on there and then it gets stuck. And this has been a problem throughout history. So one of the first steps was in 1568, Jacques Passan in France made the first real machine for making bolts and screws that could properly match up. So it's like a threading machine, basically. Wow. And it was okay. And in 1641, now we move over to England, where Hindley of York made a machine that was more efficient and could better mass produce this. So we're really going into the Industrial Revolution here. And the ability to make matching nuts and bolts is really important for building all the machinery that they're using during the Industrial Revolution. So coming out of the Industrial Revolution, J&W Wyatt in England decides to create a factory process for the mass production of nuts and bolts. Um, this means now we're producing nuts and bolts even better than ever. I'm bringing this up because this is all happening in England. And England really is the heart of the sort of industrial revolution and they're the biggest country in the world at the time thanks to all their colonialization. And they're also making most of the tripods and the best tripods in the world. So when we think of cameras in that era or in the 1800s, we think of Germany, we think of Leica, uh, but England really owned the tripods and eventually they would own the standards. So in 1841, Joseph Whitworth in England, the name Whitworth is gonna be very important because that's literally the name of the standard. He creates the BSW, which is the British Standard Whitworth. And what he's done is he gathers up nuts and bolts from all over England mostly, mm -hmm. and looks at the threads and tries to figure out what, is, what are people doing most often? Like what are the most common things? and he creates a couple of different standards. The first, see, he decides to measure everything in the width of the bolt, like the diameter, mm -hmm. and then the number of threads per inch. And a couple of the most popular standards are the 3 8 inch and the quarter inch with 20 threads per inch. And on your camera, there's almost certainly the same quarter inch, 20 threads per inch, standard that Joseph Whitworth standardized in 1841. It has not really changed since then. In 1853, the Royal Photographic Society is founded and they eventually adopt what's called the BSW quarter inch 20 standard for smaller cameras. But larger cameras never used this. Larger cameras use the 3 8 inch. And if you look on the bottom of big lenses, you'll see a lot of them will have both standards oh, okay. side by side. And the 3 8 inch is convenient because you can actually put in a little bushing that will adapt it down to the quarter inch size. So you can adapt it. It's the same, the 3 8 inch is also what your tripod has to connect the head to it. I have a question. Yes. Why is it in inches and not metric? That's key too. And this is a matter of some debate because I, only really America at this point uses the imperial system. The rest mm -hmm. of the world loves metric, and so they sometimes get offended. Like, why are you forcing me to use inches for this? Nobody uses inches. Yeah. It's because England came up with it, and the camera industry, once we find a standard, we never change it. Like, it's been 150 years since this standard has been around, and we're still putting it in inches on our cameras. Now, there is a metric version of it, because ISO has since made their own standards for this and they created a metric version that is equivalent and matches up just fine, but okay. people still call, call it the quarter inch 20. Um, I tried to decide when we actually switched over to the quarter inch 20 in camera manufacturing because when I looked at my old cameras, they all had the 3 8 inch version. So I did a sampling of cameras and I found like 1935, the Leicas, 
the Nikon 1, the 1948 Canon S, they all had the bigger 3 8 inch, but then suddenly every camera I sampled from the mid 50s on had switched over to the quarter inch. So like the 1957 Canon L1, the 1958 Can Nikon S3, the 1959 Nikon F that launched the F mount, all had the quarter inch socket. So I could not find any reference to the camera industry saying like, okay, let's switch from 3 8 to 1 quarter, but they seem to have done that in around 1956. And then suddenly like everything I sample other than like medium format cameras uses the smaller mount. So it wasn't until 1973 that somebody actually standardized this. ISO came along and actually wrote all of this down. And since then, everybody has been using it. So I guess the rest is history. I do want to ask one more question though. The flash mount is an ISO standard. Yeah. And the tripod mount is an ISO standard. And the film sensitivity, the sensor sensitivity is an ISO standard. But those three things are all ISO standards, but we only call the sensor sensitivity by the word ISO. And that just seems ambiguous to me. Isn't that, it's like, isn't that a little bit annoying? Like they're all ISO. But when we say ISO, we know we're talking about sensor sensitivity. Anyway, Tony, I feel like we had some interesting facts today, and I think we should do another episode like this where we find other interesting facts and then dig in and find out where they started. So if any of you have suggestions about things we could research or if you know an interesting fact that we can put in a future episode, you can let us know in the comments down below. I could do a straight up hour on the history of the BNC connector. If Please. Anybody... I, I just appreciate honoring the nerd forefathers who've standardized, who've done these like very basic boring things that now permeate our lives. Yeah, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. That is very cool. Nerdy giants. Nerdy, nerdy giants. <laughs> and we take it all for granted. And I do feel better for knowing about those things. Thank you, Squarespace. If you want your own amazing website, whether it's for your portfolio or your hair salon or your restaurant or your landscaping business, any type of website, Squarespace is the perfect way to do it. They make your pictures and your content look awesome on computers, on tablets, on mobile devices. Their designers have it all taken care of to make it easy for you. Head to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Get a 14-day free trial, no credit card required. If you love it, the coupon code Chelsea will get you 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. We'll see you all soon. We have a few more podcast episodes ready to go. So subscribe so that you can see when those come out. And thanks. Bye. Bye.